Hello, my Pottery Posse. How are you today? I hope you're doing great because every day is a great day to play with some clay, especially today, because today we are looking at making this cute little bitty face. I know these are kind of pitiful, but it's what I have. <laughs> so without further ado, let's get started. I am starting out by wedging both pieces of clay, red and white, so that I can marble them very little, and then they won't have bubbles in the clay, and you know, it'll be all homogenous and everything. Now, if you're unaware of how to wedge, I use the ram's head technique, which pushes the clay on itself without adding air. I tried to show you how to do this from the side, but when you don't have the proper hand position, it doesn't really do a good job. So um, there's that. Anyways, um, I usually do about 50 times in one direction and then I'll turn it on its side and do another 50. The point is to align the clay platelets and work out all the air so that you don't have any explosions in the kiln like this one had. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I shot it with a gun. But it will explode in the kiln if you uh, have air bubbles. So, you know, it'll sort of be like this, except not quite as explosive. But, you know, it could ruin other pieces that are in the kiln next to it. So, uh, trust me, just wedge your clay really well. Okay, okay. <laughs> So once you're done wedging, you will cut your pieces in half and then slam wedge them together, which is basically, you know, just slamming them together. And that way there's no air between the layers. Since we are doing this, I like to flatten my pieces out with just a slight curve in the middle before slamming so that I don't have any pockets of air. After slamming, we will do some minimal wedging to get the swirling process started. You don't want to do too much because a lot of swirling happens on the wheel. And you won't like the end result if you do too much wedging beforehand. This first time, we are only going to wedge 10 times in the direction of the layers. Then wedge on the other end four times and then be done. Okay! Let's count together, boys and girls. One, two, three, four! You did it! Yay! I usually slam my piece in a brick or a ball, but since I'm going to make a bunch of small vases, I'm going to cut this brick into slices. Wowza, look at that cross section, it looks so good. Okay, now get all your tools and get your throwing area all ready. Clean off your bat with water. Now the water does have a purpose, just so you know. And round off your clay pieces to ready them for throwing. Now round is the best shape for your clay so that when you throw it down, you won't trap air on the bottom and the bottom of your piece will be nice and flat with no pockets or divots. If it's slightly off, just scoot it over without unsticking it from the bat. If it unsticks from your bat, re-wet your bat just a little and try again. Sometimes too much and too little water can cause your clay not to stick. Wet your clay and go as fast as you possibly can on the wheel with it turning counterclockwise. Now that is important to these specific instructions. Anchor your elbows and your <laughs> hip bones and lean into the clay with your left hand cradling the outside and the butt pressing into the clay directly in front of you. And your right hand should be a loose fist pressing down on the top with a medium pressure. You can see that as I lean in using my body weight to shape the clay and not my strength, the clay becomes perfectly centered, not wobbling to and fro. If you end up using your own strength, you will find yourself very sore the next day. So try to rely on your own body weight. Now time for real wedging. Now I know what you're thinking. 
But Emily, we already wedged this. I know. But wheel wedging helps to center and further homogenize your clay. So it's very important. Start with your left hand in the same position, but in your right hand, use a damp sponge to compress the clay between your two hands from the bottom all the way to the top, bringing the clay upwards. Rewet your hands to minimize friction and compress the clay back down with your fist on top, pressing it down. I normally do this about two to five times. Make sure your clay hump is a rounded cylinder and begin to make the well. With your elbows still anchored in your hips, place one hand on top of the other with a full sponge in the middle. Now when I say full, I mean full of water. Place the pad of your middle finger in the very center of your clay and begin pressing down with your hands at a 45 degree angle. There are different methods of making the well, but this is how I prefer to do it and this is how I learned, so this is how I'm gonna teach you. If you begin to feel friction, squeeze the sponge between your hands for added water. Makes things super easy so you don't have to start and stop over and over again. To measure the thickness or depth of the bottom, use a clean pin tool and stick it straight down in the center of your piece. Carefully spin it and bring it straight up. The slip made from throwing will leave a little bitty ring or line around the pin tool indicating the thickness. I aim for about a fourth of an inch because I like to trim my bases. But for this one, we don't really need that much. I'm not going to be trimming it, so it can be a little bit thinner. To close up the hole you just made, use the same hand position and push clay down from the top of the rim all the way down to the bottom. Normally, one time of doing this will close it up for me. Now flatten out the bottom by pulling your fingers back towards you without pushing down. Now that's very important because you don't wanna make your base thinner. You just want to flatten it out. Use a sponge to smooth everything out, especially the top edge to get a nice even lip so that when you pull, you're not going to have an uneven lip. The next step is making a pull. With your wheel going a bit slower than half speed, your elbows anchored in your hips, a damp sponge in your right hand and your left hand in the well, you will start all the way at the bottom, at the bat, and compressing the clay between your fingers with the most minimal surface area as you can imagine. So just the pad of your finger and then wherever that meets the sponge on both sides. Pro tip, as you can see, the pointer finger of my inside hand is actually anchored onto my outside hand. That way I know that my hands are moving at the exact same place at the exact same time. No mistakes here. You wanna go slow enough that your fingers go around the clay once before you move it up. This ensures an even pull. If your pull is uneven, you will run into lumps and potentially cut into your piece with your fingers by pressing too hard in a certain spot. Speaking of finger pressure, you want to only apply a medium to soft pressure together. If you put too much pressure, you will end up moving too much clay at once and your piece will likely flop or be uneven or get cut in half. Getting the right speed and pressure takes practice. You can do it though. I believe in you, okay? Don't be afraid to mess up and start over a bunch of times, okay? It's just clay. We can re-wedge it and reuse it. But if this is your first time, I am just making a slight suggestion that you use regular unmarbled clay, okay? And that way, if you mess up, it's not a big deal at all. But that is why prepping more clay than what you need is a good idea. Just in case you decide to experiment a little and then it doesn't go right, if you mess up, it's all good. Uh, attempt number one. Now a key to making the most of every pull is to start all the way at the base on the outside and then joining your hand on the inside once they're at the exact same height. So you can see here that I'm pressing in with my exterior hand all the way from the bottom and my interior hand is just resting on the inside in position waiting for my right hand to be at the same place as my left 
once they meet, I will start bringing them up together at the same speed, making sure that my fingers are at the exact same spot on the inside as they are on the outside. Now, if your fingers are side by side instead of matching up perfectly, even if they're at the same level, you will tax the clay and it will get wobbly and you'll notice it getting bigger and it may tear a hole in your piece. So make sure those fingers are at the exact same spot. Now you wanna make sure that your piece stays cone shaped as you make your pulls and then uh, widen once you're finished pulling. I made the mistake of widening it as I was pulling. Now, normally I don't do this. I was just experimenting. It went awry. I knew better, but I did it anyways. Now, what I should have done was keep everything more cone-like and then brought it out from the base once I had done my last pull. But instead, I did this, making the base super wide and ball-like, and that made it pretty hard to choke in the neck later on. So, um learn from me what not to do what to do what not to do what to do okay let me see if i can manage to get this shape buffed out i'm using a method called choking i know it's a horrible name right i am making sure my hands and the piece are very wet and i'm wrapping my thumbs and pointer fingers all the way around making it a little bit smaller with every pass also, a helpful tip, if you have too much water in the base of your piece and the hole is too small to uh, soak it up with your sponge, detach your bat from the wheel, turn it upside down and pour it out. It's as easy as that. Now, this is only a trick that you can use if you haven't cut your piece off from the bat. Um, if you cut it off, your piece is more than likely going to fall. Uh, even if you think it's still good and stuck on there after cutting it off, I wouldn't trust it. So, uh, yeah. Since I have somehow managed to get this nicely shaped, it's time for the most satisfying yet um, hardest and most nerve wracking part of the whole thing. We are going to use a metal rib tilted at about a 35 or so degree angle and we are going to scrape off the sludge made from throwing to reveal the beautiful marbled pattern underneath. Now my suggestion is that you have a bucket and a towel or napkin handy for this. I like to run the metal rib along the side of my piece until I notice that it's not really taking anything off anymore. And then I will scrape off the sludge into the bucket and then I'll use my towel to wipe off the rest. That way, when I go to clean off my piece again, I'm not being counterproductive by using a dirty rib. Okay, now that we've made this guy, let's cut this from the bat, get a new bat, and make another. This time, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, and uh, I'm just going to let you watch because, you know, sometimes watching is just as helpful as listening. So, enjoy, and uh, don't forget to make one along with me.
do one more for my ASMR friends. <laughs> having a heart attack. I'm having a heart attack. Psst, I have something to tell you. It turned out just fine. <laughs> Here it is. Now, anyone up for some bloopers before our final reveal? <laughs> Please get off of me. Please go away. Please go away. I don't know what you are. Please go away. And yes, I was singing to a bug. <sighs> Exact same size with like half the amount of clay. What the heck? What the heck? <laughs> okay, it's almost the same. Now I just have to make a smaller one. Now here is our final reveal. I fired this in a cone 05 bisque and then glazed them with a mid to high fire clear glaze and ran a glaze firing at cone 5. Did they turn out beautiful or what? Thank you all so much for watching. If you liked what you see and you want to see more, go ahead and click right here or over here for a playlist. And if you wanted to subscribe, you can always do that right here. I guess that's it for today, folks. But until the next one, stay creative, my friends. Bye!